Hello, everyone. I am really pleased that uh, you all have joined us today. Um, I think we can go ahead and begin. Um, I'm Debbie Gould with the League of Women Voters of Tennessee, and I'm delighted to be able to partner with the League of Women Voters of Oak Ridge and with the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign for this very important conversation about healthcare in Tennessee. And um, we will be recording this session and we will be sharing this recording with our partner organizations afterwards so that um, anybody who doesn't have a chance to, to hear it today will, will be able to later on. Um, and uh, we again want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters of Oak Ridge that has really done a lot of work to pull together this very distinguished panel and really give us the depth of knowledge that we need as advocates in the state to promote something that league members have been asking about for years, which is how we can actually provide Tennesseans with the health care choices that they need. So with that said, um, your questions can go in the chat and uh, we will be um, uh, providing the opportunity for them to be asked later in the program. But right now, I'm gonna turn the program over to Judy Reutemann who uh, chairs the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign, who will introduce our panelists. Hi everyone, welcome to the panel in support of Medicaid expansion in Tennessee. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign, uh, which is co-hosting this program. And uh, we're proud to be co-sponsors along with the League of Women Voters. The Tennessee Healthcare Campaign is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization for over 30 years, we have worked for equitable, affordable access to quality health care for all Tennesseans. We advocate for policies and programs like Medicaid expansion that improve the health and well being of Tennesseans. We're also a nonprofit insurance agency. As we speak, volunteers are answering our toll free number and connecting callers to our licensed agents who can help them find the best Affordable Care Act marketplace plan for their personal circumstances. We have a terrific panel of presenters today for our discussion on Medicaid expansion. They have a lot of ground to cover, so we plan to let them speak uninterrupted for the next hour. If you have questions, please write them in the chat. We plan to reserve the last half hour of the program for audience questions. So getting into introducing our speakers, Margaret Durgan, originally from the state of Vermont, Margaret was the regional early interventionist, a regional coordinator of Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, a team leader for Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, and the chair of the Franklin County Child Protective Team. From 2002 to 2006, she worked as a child protective investigator in Sarasota, Florida. Margaret came to Tennessee in 2006 to take a position at the University of Tennessee in the Tennessee Early Intervention System. In 2008, she was hired as the executive director of the Child Advocacy Center in Anderson County. Under her direction, the doors to the new CAC opened in 2008 the CAC is now a state licensed prevention agency and a nationally accredited child advocacy center. Elisa Lapolt was born in Wilmington, Delaware and grew up in East Tennessee. She graduated from the University of Tennessee with a bachelor's degree in communications and worked for 15 years as a political and policy reporter for several news organizations including the Nashville Banner, the Associated Press in Madison, Wisconsin, and the Gannett News Service in Tallahassee, Florida. In 2004, she opened a Tallahassee-based lobbying and public relations firm and advocated for health and mental health issues. She helped establish a 4.5 million state-funded program for free and charitable clinics to serve uninsured individuals. 
In 2016, she was named executive director of NAMI Florida. Following the tragedy in 2018 at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Elisa was named by Governor Rick Scott to his mental health work group. She was instrumental in passing landmark legislation requiring Florida schools to provide mental health awareness programs to students. After the death of her nephew from suicide in April 2019, Elisa decided to return home to Tennessee and on October 2019 was named Director of Policy and Advocacy for NAMI Tennessee. Neil McBride is a graduate of the University of Virginia Law School. After working with Ralph Nader in Washington, DC, he moved to Tennessee to establish a public interest law firm. He then established and directed Rural Legal Services of Tennessee in Oak Ridge. In 2013, Rural Legal Services merged with the Legal Aid Program in Nashville, which Neil served as general counsel. In 2008, President Obama appointed him to the board of directors of the Tennessee Valley Authority, a position he held until 2012. After living in Oak Ridge for about 35 years, he retired and moved to Knoxville. He serves on the board of the Tennessee Justice Center. And Catherine Crawford is an advanced practice nurse practitioner, board certified family practice nurse practitioner and a health policy scholar based in Knoxville, Tennessee. During her time as a critical care RN, she experienced firsthand how health policy directly affects the health of Tennesseans. And she began exploring how Tennessee healthcare system could be transformed to best serve all Tennesseans. Catherine Crawford earned her doctorate of nursing practice from the University of Tennessee and continues her scholarship as a community-based practitioner and clinical instructor at the University of Tennessee. Catherine Crawford, I'd like to start with you by asking you if you would please give us a quick overview explaining how healthcare in Tennessee is funded. Sure. Thank you, Judy and Debbie, and thank you to the League of Women Voters of Oak Ridge, the League of Women Voters of Tennessee, and the uh, Tennessee Healthcare Campaign for hosting today's panel. And I will try to be quick as I give a background on um, healthcare funding in Tennessee. Okay, so let's dive into the question about healthcare, um, how healthcare is currently funded in Tennessee. So we have five major ways healthcare is funded. Um, as I break down the categories, it's important to note that when I discuss percentages of the population covered by a particular type of insurance, the percentages actually add up to over 100% because some individuals may be covered by more than one type of insurance. So for instance, adults 65 and older may be covered under Medicare as well as a private supplemental insurance plan. So the first category of insurance coverage is employer-sponsored health insurance, of which approximately 50% of Tennesseans um, are covered through their employer. So this type of health coverage is subsidized by the federal government as employer contributions to health insurance are exempt from income and payroll taxes. Historically, employers covered the majority of job-based health premiums, and um, a health premium is just the monthly fee for the insurance coverage. Um, but over time, the employee's share of the health premium has increased significantly, especially over the past 10 years. So at the same time as we've seen uh, premiums increase, so too have the deductibles with these plans. So that's the amount the individual has to pay out of pocket before the insurer begins paying. So to give you a better idea of what that looks like, in 2018, the average employee paid $5,500 for a family pay plan with a $3,900 deductible on top of that. That's a 38% and 65% increase respectively from our 2010 figures. So for some Tennessee families, this is a financial burden that jeopardizes their health insurance coverage. The second cover, uh, category I'm going to be discussing is Medicare, and that's um, the category that about 19% of Tennesseans are covered under. So that's our federal health insurance program for people 65 and older, and some people younger than 65 with disabilities may uh, qualify. 
The third category is private individual market, which is how approximately 14% of Tennesseans get their coverage. And within this category is the healthcare.gov marketplace um, coverage, which includes uh, private individual market plans that comply with the Affordable Care Act and are federally subsidized for people under 400% of uh, po federal poverty line. So about 3% of Tennesseans are enrolled in marketplace plans currently. Uh, the fourth category is coverage through the Military and Veterans Administration. Uh, about 6% of Tennesseans are covered that way. And the fifth category uh, is the one that we'll be discussing most today. And that's Tennessee's managed Medicaid program called TenCare. Uh, Medicaid is a health insurance program created by the federal government in 1965 to provide coverage, increase access to care, and improve health outcomes for underserved populations uh, for whom private coverage is unaffordable or unavailable. So Tennessee's managed Medicaid program, TenCare, provides health coverage to eligible low-income adults, children, pregnant women, older adults, and people with disabilities. It covers approximately 20% of all Tennesseans and 50%, so half of all Tennessee children. TenCare is absolutely vital. It's funded jointly by the federal government and the state of Tennessee. So as kind of a background, when Medicaid was created in 1965, two categories of individuals could enroll. You had um, the first category was the aged, blind, and disabled individuals. And then the second ca category um, was parents and children receiving public assistance. In 1989, all pregnant women and children with incomes at 133% of the federal po poverty level were eligible, so they expanded. Then in 2010, the Affordable Care Act envisioned uh, a near universal health coverage nationwide. So the law created a new Medicaid eligibility category for individuals aged 19 to 64 with incomes at or below 138% of the federal poverty level. So 138% of the federal poverty level comes out to a little over $17,000 a year for a single person. And as I mentioned, Medicaid is jointly funded by the federal government and state government. So states received an enhanced federal medical assistance participation rate for this Medicaid expansion population and capped the state's contributions to 10% of the costs. So it was very attractive <clears throat> to, to states. So there was a Supreme Court case two years later that allowed states to determine whether or not they would adapt Medicaid expansion. Um, and 12 states have chosen not to adopt Medicaid expansion. Tennessee is one of those states. And many of these individuals remain in the Tennessee healthcare coverage gap. These Tennesseans are at such a poverty level that they do not qualify for a P Affordable Care Act marketplace assistance, yet they're ineligible for Medicaid because Tennessee has not expanded coverage. So this coverage gap accounts for over 300,000 Tennesseans without health care coverage. The U.S. Census is now estimating that over 836,000 Tennesseans are without any health insurance coverage. So that's approximately 10% of Tennesseans who do not currently have health insurance coverage. We know that all people need health care. It's a fundamental human need. So how does this 10% of the Tennessee population who are uninsured fund that necessary health care? And this is a really complicated question. So many people without health coverage postpone necessary care. The cost of being uninsured can quite literally cost someone their life. Uh, from my time as a critical car care RN in East Tennessee, I have experienced this scenario firsthand. Postponing necessary care is absolutely devastating. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really thorough overview. Neil McBride, can you weigh in on this as well? Who is, who is left behind in the current um, way that healthcare is funded? Sure, I, I, first I'm gonna say, I, I saw that uh, the, the founder of uh, the, the coalition is on our call, Tony Gar, and I'm tempted to yield my time to Tony, but I think that wouldn't really be fair to, to him. So I will, uh, skip that uh, and 
I, I just want to preface by saying that uh, I, I started as anybody who really sort of wants to know about the federal program uh, by, by calling Gordon Bonnyman with the Tennessee Justice Center in Nashville and apologize for the simplicity of my questions. And Gordon basically laughed and said, he has been to serious kind of national uh, level briefings with federal officials who have helped draft the law who admitted they didn't understand the full act themselves as, as Gordon himself confessed. So uh, this is, is, is complex and I'm gonna try to keep it uh, as simple as I can. Uh, the federal bill helps in two ways. First, who's covered and then second, by in, uh, adding additional medical needs to be covered. Uh, who is essentially nearly all adults with incomes at or below 138% of poverty. Uh, and, and they'll have a, 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 a good range of coverage for uh, basic medical needs. The current poverty level for a family of four is $26,500. 138% of that is $36,570. Uh, so, so that's a pretty material jump, especially in a low wage state like Tennessee. Uh, and, and when you compare that to what Tennessee is doing, it's important to understand that our current program is not fundamentally income-based. A person can have zero income and still not fit a category that will qualify them for uh, public, publicly provided uh, medical health insurance. Uh, and rather they must fit a category depending upon their family status uh, and, and the type of disease that they want covered. Um, so a person with breast cancer can have coverage when a person with a broken leg may not. Uh, um, and the new legislation would, would go a long way toward uh, evening out these kind of disparities among uh, people that need, that need coverage. Uh, and then the substance, the substantive additions that the new, the federal program would offer, uh, the most important is uh, coverage for mental health and substance abuse, which is essentially uh, not covered under the current Tennessee program. Um, I'll, I'll talk kind of briefly about the impact of uh, not accepting this funding. Um, since the program, the federal program began in about 2014, the state of Tennessee has essentially rejected over $10 billion in healthcare benefits uh, for the most disadvantaged people of the state. Um, over a billion dollars a year. Uh, and, and I 
just going to digress and put it in context by noting that last month the state legislature scurried into special session to approve giving Ford Motor Company about $900,000 to promote a five and a half billion dollar investment in West Tennessee at the same time the legislature and the state leaders are rejecting over a billion dollars every year that would help their neediest citizens get uh, um, more access to health coverage. Um, that's just a, a, a real brief introduction to the implications of being able to join the federal program. Um, and, and I can answer questions when, when we're when, when, the, when the panel is uh, finished. Great, thank you, Neil. I wanna uh, turn to Elisa Lapold um, and, and see if, if you could um, speak specifically about um, lack of access to insurance and the impact of, for people with mental illnesses. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, thanks, Judy. Um, I, I do, I want to pause for a second and say I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I have a special place in my heart for Anderson County because my first job out of journalism school at UT was at the Clinton Courier News where I was a cub reporter. <laughs> so, um, it's been a while since I've visited there, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a very special place. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with my organization, NAMI Tennessee, NAMI is the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and I work for the state organization. And our national office is very interested in, in the 12 non-expansion states, including Tennessee. And here's the reason. Medicaid is the largest payer of mental health and substance abuse services in the country. And just to clarify something, TennCare, Medicaid here in Tennessee, does pay for mental health and substance abuse services. Medicare does not, but Medicaid does. And if we break it down just into numbers of people, the, one of the, the numbers that we often use for people who would qualify under Medicaid, a TennCare expansion is 300,000 people. 300,000 people with an income level that's a little bit too high right now to qualify for current ten care, um, but too low to be able to afford private insurance or maybe they're not employed or to get on the health insurance exchange. So if we look at the statistic that one in five individual, individuals in a given year is affected by mental illness, that's 60,000 people here in Tennessee that are not getting healthcare coverage and not getting the needed treatment and services. Now, if we take that a step further, one in 20 people have a severe mental illness. And by that, I mean schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And so that's 15,000 Tennesseans who are uninsured, not getting services they need. So what's the impact? Dr. Crawford said earlier that people who don't have insurance, can't afford healthcare, they wait, they wait too long to get healthcare. They wait too long to go to the doctors or a nurse practitioner. They wait too long to go to the ER and the effects are devastating. She says she's personally seen it. When it comes to individuals with mental illness, it's also devastating. There's a couple things that could happen. First, their condition can deteriorate to the point where it's very hard to um, get the, the needed therapy and services to have a happy, productive life it makes it that much more difficult. In some cases, individuals, their, their disease might manifest as behavioral problems, which could lead them to the criminal justice system. So the lack of health insurance can literally result in effects on the criminal justice system. 
And then finally, for those people who don't get the needed treatment and services, it could lead to suicide. And we're already seeing record numbers of overdose deaths in this state. So the lack of health insurance is um, taking lives and ne negatively affecting lives in our state. Thank you. Um, Dr. Crawford, could you explain some more about the impact for people with chronic illnesses? Sure, yeah. So um, as kind of a background, Tennessee already has an excess burden of the top three chronic diseases. Um, so 13% of Tennesseans have diabetes versus the 10% national average. 39% of Tennesseans have hypertension, so high blood pressure versus 31% national average. 9% of Tennesseans have cardiovascular disease versus the 6% national average. So according to the um, United Health Foundation database that ranks um, the states according to health, um, in, in 2019, Tennessee's health ranked 44 out of 50 states, meaning 43 states were healthier than Tennessee overall. And one of the main contributors to this poor health ranking is the high prevalence of multiple chronic conditions across our state. So we have more Tennesseans burdened with chronic conditions, but then we have less Tennesseans with health insurance coverage to properly manage these chronic conditions. We know that a lack of health insurance coverage is associated with lower rates of preventive care, delays in necessary care, foregone care, uh, medical bankruptcy, and increased mortality, so death. Um, if we take a look at the states which have expanded Medicaid, uh, there's over 600 studies since 2014 detailing the positive effects of Medicaid expansion in states where it has been adopted. Uh, according to a recent Vanderbilt, um, it was a joint study between Vanderbilt and um, Harvard, Medicaid expansion has a protective effects for residents of Southern states. So Medicaid expansion was linked to a decrease in self-reported health declines and a greater likelihood of maintaining baseline health. Uh, one of the most recent reviews showed a positive correlation between expansion and improvements in mortality rates. So one of the ways we could most impact the health of Tennesseans is to expand healthcare coverage, leading to greater healthcare accessibility, quality and cost-effective chronic disease management, and better out outcomes uh, overall for Tennesseans. Margaret Durgan, I I'm hoping you can um, bring this home to us. Can you give us some examples about how ten care policy affects the families that you serve? We can't hear you, Margaret. There you okay, go. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I can. I have some specific examples. And I'd like to thank you for letting me share this information on behalf of the children and families that we serve here at the Child Advocacy Center. We see about 400 to 500 children annually, and the majority of the um, children we see are covered by 10 care, probably at, at least 85%. And then we do have some that have private insurance, um, but there are always children that don't have any insurance for one reason or another. Um, they may fall in the crack because the family makes too much money for them to get 10 care, but then they can't afford 10 care or insurance through the marketplace. And sometimes the parents struggle um, with the application process. It's overwhelming. Um, they just can't get through it, can't collect the documentation, they give up. Um, but I do have um, another type of, of family situation that we see here. And it's that oftentimes people move to Tennessee, they wanna get a fresh start. Um, some of us have, have moved here or moved back here. And um, they may have qualified for Medicaid in another state. Well, moving here, that Medicaid isn't valid. And then they may not qualify. Excuse me, I think. I'm sorry, I think I got kicked off here for just a minute. Am I back with you? We can see you and hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, they, they don't qualify for um, Medicaid here in Tennessee and yet they, they don't have insurance. So um, I have several stories here 
where I've changed the name, but the, the stories are real. So these are siblings, Cody and Colby, and they were on Medicaid in another state and the family moved to Tennessee to get a fresh start, but the children no longer qualified for Medicaid. Not able to afford the children's prescriptions for their ADHD medicine, the family resorted to cheap over-the-counter and natural remedies. The children's behavior began to um, escalate, it, they continued to worsen. They had difficulties in school, in the neighborhood, at home. Eventually, the Department of Children's Services became involved. We were able to provide some pro bono counseling here at the Child Advocacy Center. And this is a, a story in progress. Um, we don't really know where this is going to end up, but you know, they're getting some services. Another story is about Kaylee. So after divorce, Kaylee's father had both legal and physical custody of Kaylee and then moved out of state where he chose not to insure her. But Kaylee needed medical attention. Her vision was very poor. And she also had severe anxiety and that resulted in frequent truancy and other behaviors. The father sent her back to Tennessee, giving physical custody to her mother. For the next four and a half years, her mother had to pay out of pocket for any medical care that Kaylee received. Because she didn't have legal custody, she couldn't get her enrolled in 10 care. That's what I was told. Um, so, she had to pay out of pocket. She took care of Kaylee's vision. The dentist had to wait. Every time Kaylee got sick, they went to an urgent care. Her mother was always afraid of a giant emergency room bill. But urgent care had to be paid each time they went or they could be refused treatment the next time. Once they couldn't make the payment and it went against the mother's credit. Kaylee was able to get some pro bono counseling at the CAC. Eventually, Kaylee turned 18 and she decided not to go on in school at this time. She works as a cashier and she rents an apartment with a friend. She's now 19 and she doesn't have insurance. She doesn't qualify for 10 care and any insurance available to her is too expensive. She's holding off seeing a doctor for recurring abdominal pain, which is so severe she'll double over. When that happens, she misses work. She thinks she might have an ovarian cyst, but she doesn't want a huge medical bill. And then there's Jacob. Jacob grew up in Tennessee. His parents were both self-employed and the family had no insurance. So Jacob never had regular medical care. He turned 18 and tried to get insurance himself, but he didn't qualify for 10 care and he couldn't afford to buy insurance. He's having problems with his wisdom teeth and he needs them removed. He wonders how single young men get insurance that they can afford. And there's Noah. Noah, who's 21, grew up in a religious family that didn't believe in insurance or medical care. So medical care wasn't part of his childhood. As a single young adult, he doesn't qualify for 10 care and he can't afford insurance from the marketplace. His gums are swollen and painful. He needs dental work, including a bridge. But you know, children don't grow up in isolation. They have parents or caregivers that protect them and provide for them and they struggle too. So. Here's Amanda. Amanda is Kaylee's mother. And Amanda struggled to pay for housing and other bills, including the medical care that Kaylee needed. When Amanda paid out of pocket for Kaylee, Amanda was going without care herself. She postponed needed gallbladder surgery for three months, trying to pull together enough money to cover the immediate costs. The outstanding hospital bills went against her credit. Credit that was important when she needed to replace her car. And obviously having a home and transportation make it easier to work or to get work. So Amanda did her best to prevent Kaylee from feeling stressed out by their financial situation. But it was very stressful for Amanda knowing that she was ill and that she wasn't taking care of herself. 
The financial stability of the family was always in jeopardy. Many times she wanted to talk with a therapist, but she couldn't afford this service. She said she found she just had to get through it all somehow. Today, Amanda has what she calls catastrophic insurance and it doesn't cover Kaylee. And it's catastrophic for Amanda because she doesn't know how she'd pay for the deductible, which she said is $3,400 or any co-pays. Her cholesterol medication is $500 a month, not covered by this insurance. Sometimes she has to choose between getting medicine and paying rent. And a final story that you know we've mentioned before, and this is maybe the saddest story of all, Susan's story. Susan worked in a facility and didn't have health insurance. There were always other pressing needs such as paying rent, putting food on the table or buying gas for the car. Getting medical attention for a minor injury wasn't important enough to run up a medical bill. She could doctor it at home. Unfortunately, this injury didn't heal. Susan complained to friends that it was infected, but she kept putting off getting medical care. The infection spread throughout her body. Susan died. So, um, and that was hard to read, knowing who she was. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate you sharing those stories with us. I know they're real people to you and um, it helped bring this um, discussion from the policy to the personal for the rest of us as well. I wanna turn back to Dr. Crawford. Are, are there certain communities that are disproportionately impacted by the 10 care policies? Uh, yes, so some Tennesseans are more likely than others to be uninsured. Uh, this includes men, people of color, younger adults, and those with less education and income. We know that 97% of the people in the coverage gap live in the South. Several states that have not expanded Medicaid have large populations of people of color. So the state decisions to not expand Medicaid dis disproportionately affect people of color. People in the healthcare coverage gap have limited family income and live below the poverty level. They are likely employed in very low wage jobs, employed part-time or have a fragile or unpredictable connection to the workforce. It is unlikely that employer-based coverage is really an option for them. The most common industries for people in the healthcare coverage gap are restaurants or food services and construction. Um, so these jobs were, or they are vital to the state's economy and were considered essential during the pandemic, yet often pay very little. Um, so yes, absolutely certain communities in Tennessee are disproportionately impacted by the decision to not expand Medicaid. And Neil McBride, I wanna ask about the economic impact of our 10 care policy. How does lack of funding affect healthcare and hospitals in rural areas in particular? Neil, I think you're muted. Or maybe we lost oh, Neil altogether. I, I, I think it's useful to think of them as in, in five different categories. Um, the first is the obvious impact on the family, the stress on the immediate family, the burden they'll often put on their extended family and, and, and community supporters. Uh, um, and, and that's, you know, we've heard the, the uh, implications of that from, from several other speakers. The, the second is, is uh, without a financially viable base of patients, uh, Tennessee hospitals can't stay open. And uh, we have the highest rate of hospital closings of any state in the nation. And I'm not talking about per capita, but absolute numbers. In, in the last decade, we've lost 11 to 14 hospitals 
uh, by, by closing. The, the number is not as clear as you might think because some hospitals close and reopen again, some reopen with far fewer services, some get leased to other operators with less services, but it's 11 to 14, uh, which is more hospital closings than the state of Texas with four times our population. Um, we really stand out in that area. And it's clear that this trend is gonna continue. There are over 20 hospitals in Tennessee right now, losing money every year. Uh, and the people that I've talked to that follow this are expecting close to 20 closures in the next three years. Um, the uh, the and, and these closures are directly correlated to the decision by a state to accept Medicaid expansion. Uh, Seventy two percent of all hospital closings in the country are in states that rejected Medicaid expansion. Uh, and to make the decision not to uh, allow Medicaid expansion in Tennessee, to put this in context, um, Tennessee hospitals jointly arrived at a creative uh, decision to, as a group, pay the state's contribution to Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid expansion, and, and they would essentially tax themselves uh, rather than have the, the state portion be paid by the state itself. And uh, so there is literally no cost to the state to the, uh, from the decision to uh, join the Medicaid program. I, I need to say that their pledge to do that has technically expired, but people who follow this say there's absolutely no doubt that the hospitals will renew their promise to pay the state portion of uh, the Medicaid cost uh, because it's so clearly in their financial interest to do so. Uh, beyond the immediate kind of medical uh, implications, there's an impact on communities especially the small communities where most uh, hospital closures take place. Hospitals offer among the best paying, most stable jobs in the area, staff and families buy goods and services that are an important economic contributor to the community. Uh, and they're also leaders in churches and civic activities. And when a hospital closes, the typically rural region will lose the economic benefit of their money and their, their leadership. Uh, more subtly, but I think in the long run, really critical is that when a rural community loses its hospital, it will face a very difficult challenge in attracting new businesses. When businesses are looking around, they're, in a, they're uh, looking for uh, not only, they're looking for communities that offer kind of long-term stability to their employees. Uh, and when they're looking at a community where their staff is 
going to have to drive 30 minutes to an hour for medical care. In many cases, those communities are not even going to make the list of being considered for location for new business. Uh, and then one last impact that you don't hear quite as much about, but I think is just really critical, is that medical bills are the leading cause of personal bankruptcy in the nation. Tennessee has one of the highest personal bankruptcy rates in the country. And the correlation between the lack of access to health care and the debts that, that Margaret described so well among, among her clients uh, is, a, is a huge reason for personal bankruptcy. Uh, and this trend not only causes families to suffer medically, but, but financially uh, with, with implications, not just on the immediate family, but extended families and the, 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 the ability of, of these men and women to contribute to their communities. So uh, there's, there's very, I think, uh, wide ranging and, and kind of non-medical implications to uh, what is happening as a result of our failure to uh, take full advantage of, of uh, federal funding for healthcare needs. Thank you, Neil. The, the other thing I, I wanted to raise up is that we're having this discussion in the midst of a international pandemic. And I'm curious, Dr. Crawford, if, if you could talk about the impact of COVID on, on 10 care policy or the impact of 10 care policy on COVID, how, how those two things relate to each other. Sure. So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic created both a public health crisis and an economic crisis. So even with policies that supported many Tennesseans through this unprecedented time, both insured and uninsured Tennesseans, um, many were facing unexpected medical expenses, um, which are compounded by months of unemployment or decreased employment. So though the unemployment rate may be getting close to pre-COVID levels in Tennessee, many, many Tennesseans are trying to catch back up on things like rent. Um, Early on in the COVID pandemic, it became very clear that certain populations were disproportionately affected by COVID. So Black Tennesseans accounted for 20% of COVID-19 cases and 36% of deaths, but only made up 17% of the state's population. So not only are people of color more likely to be uninsured, but they are disproportionately affected by the COVID pandemic. Um, in addition, as Neil mentioned, our state's hospitals, especially in rural areas, are under immense financial pressure to the point that they risk being closed. Um, the hospitals and providers are stressed, direly so, with the impact of COVID. And for some people within, without insurance, going to an emergency department is often their only option for care. Um, and that safety net is certainly at risk. Thank you. Uh, so the American Rescue Plan that, well, first of all, before I go, go there, uh, Margaret Durgan, do, can you add to the discussion about COVID and health insurance? You need to unmute, Margaret. I'll go back to Kaylee, the 19 year old. Um, Kaylee did not get vaccinated. She, be, she's 19, she thought she had plenty of time, that she was young, she wouldn't get sick. And she did get COVID and um, it triggered um, her asthma, which um, she was asthmatic, but it was under control. Um, she, she had, about a week and a half where she was very sick. And so um, not wanting to go to the emergency room 
and not sure if she was going to get better or not. So again, it was another, another stress factor. So um, if people have COVID and they don't have insurance, even though you can get the test, you can get the vaccines, you can, um, if you're going to be hospitalized, that's another issue. Right. So um, when Congress was looking at what we needed to get through the COVID pandemic, they passed the American Rescue Plan last spring. Um, and that offers incentives to those 12 states that we've been talking about that refuse to expand Medicaid. Um, Neil, what would that mean for Tennessee? Well, it's an improvement, but it doesn't come close to eliminating the need to adopt Medicaid expansion. Uh, it's a temporary stopgap. It only lasts a few years. It, it gives tax credit for medical expenses for those under 138% of poverty, uh, but the benefits just don't approach those um, that, that would be available under a, a, a true Medicaid expansion. Uh, it, it, it could be a useful stopgap until we have a, a genuine expansion program, but uh, it's really just, a, a, it's what I would call just an unsatisfactory stopgap uh, while we uh, really face up to doing what needs to be done. So you're talking about the proposed Build Back Better uh, plan that's currently being discussed under the reconciliation bill. Right, right. Okay. Um, Catherine, could you um, also talk about the American Rescue Plan last spring and also what the, this federal fix that they're looking at now? What are the implications for Tennessee of those two policies? Yeah, so to um, continue the conversation um, on the, um, the federal fix, so um, congressional Democrats released updated text of the Build Back Better Act, um, which is using um, reconciliation. So this was on October 28th that they released this um, updated text. And so right now it's proposed as a $1.75 trillion social spending package. And it contains modified proposal, a modified proposal to cover the estimated 4 million people in the Medicaid coverage gap. So the majority of those folks live in the South. So the individuals in the coverage gap live in one of the 12 states that has opted not to expand Medicaid even with federal financial incentives to expand. So I had talked about um, that the state's portion, um, the state was responsible for 10% of the costs associated with expanding Medicaid. Well, with the, um, the American Rescue Plan, they dropped that down to 5%. Um, so President Biden's Build Back Better Act framework proposes closing the Medicaid uh, coverage gap by pro providing Amer uh, Affordable Care Act credits in uncovered states. So the federal government would fully subsidize marketplace coverage in lieu of Medicaid coverage. So basically this would provide individuals stuck in that co coverage gap with $0 premiums for marketplace plans. And as, um, you know, as Neil was saying, the marketplace plans are not um, they are not medic, it, it's not full Medicaid coverage. So they're not, they're not quite the same. Um, the legislation also extends until 2025 Affordable Care Act uh, tax credit subsidies that are set to expire in 2022. So we'll have to stay tuned to see how that all develops. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alisa, um, my next question is for you as policy and advocacy director at NAMI. You have had a lot of occasion to uh, interact with the Tennessee legislature um, and they have in the past rejected federal funding that would help expand Medicaid. So um, do you have any 
suggestions for us as to how we can encourage them to change their minds? I do, and I've been working on this issue um, since 2010, before I even got here as um, a, a lobbyist, healthcare lobbyist in Florida, which is another state that has not accepted the Medicaid expansion incentive. So the arguments are, are very similar for why they don't wanna accept the money. Um, they say that they don't want to be held accountable for keeping that money going from the state because right now the proposal would be a 90% federal fund, 10% um, state funding, but then with under the um, Rescue Plan Act, it would be even like I think 95% versus 10%. State legislators, many of them are afraid that what happens if the federal government pulls out of the deal, um, then we're stuck having to pay these millions of dollars for healthcare, and then we're gonna have to cut either services or people, and they don't wanna be in that position. I think it's political. It, there was a um, person who was president who, um, they were fundamentally opposed to. And in some of the Southern states, they just dug in and said, we're not gonna do this. And we're seeing this play out today with the mask mandates. It's, it's just a way to um, fight the federal government and the person who's currently president. So I don't wanna get into too much of the politics about it, because I'd like to get a little bit more into some talking points and solutions. I think it's interesting that they're willing to accept federal money for highways, transportation, with strings attached there, but not healthcare. I think this message should resonate with you all as the league. The Declaration of Independence declares the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How can people pursue life and happiness if they're ill, if their health care is declining? I think it's a fundamental right. And I think in, in your role, in, in our roles, we have an obligation to remind our elected officials that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is an inalienable right. Secondly, I think we have a moral obligation to remind them that not taking this money disproportionately affects people of color and people in rural communities. And they are every bit as much of this state as the rest of us who live in urban communities or are, are white. Um, I think that we have the ability to remind them of that. So the other talking point that I tend to find effective is money. When you can tell a legislator how a policy can save the state money, that goes a long way. In 10 states that have adopted Medicaid expansion, they saw a 40% decrease in hospitalizations for healthcare, uh, mental health, for mental health crises, 40%. So if we can translate that into dollars, that's huge because the state subsidizes hospitals for charity care. And that's what's breaking the bank. And we heard earlier from Neil that health excuse me, hospitals in rural areas are closing because they just can't handle the, the load anymore. That argument has been attempted. It doesn't seem to resonate with legislators, but what I've been told by several people in the coalition who do talk with legislators on this issue is mental health seems to be resonating with people because res mental health is so critical and it has been so affected by COVID 30% of Americans now report having severe anxiety and depression after COVID, since COVID and the pandemic has started. Mental health is, I think, a, a good segue conversation. Thank you. Gives us some ways to approach the legislators. Um, Margaret, I wanna give you the last word here. 
what um, what can you say, what advice can you give, <clears throat> particularly to people in State Senator Randy McNally's district um, who care about this issue? What, what can they do? They, they need to remember that they have a voice, that their perspective and their opinion is important. And so they, they can pick up the phone and make a call. Now, they might not be able to speak with a legislator directly, but staff will take their call and pass messages along. So if they can you know, be specific about, about the issue, uh, about their position and why it matters to them and what their story is, then um, follow it up with a written thank you email. It's going to, um, to come to the legislator's attention that this is an issue of importance. And people don't often think about the fact that it's the one plus one plus one that equals a lot of calls, you know? So everyone that does it is important. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I'm uh, putting in the chat a link to the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign Action Alert. Um, it's a real easy way to contact your legislator. Um, you can um, send them an email um, directly through that site. And um, I, I do want to urge everyone to do so. One of the things that we have not lifted up is that under the American Rescue Plan, um, there's significant incentives for Tennessee. Um, we're looking at $900 million that they would get if, if we could only expand Medicaid. And so I think that even though we've been working on this issue for a while, that some things have changed and it's worth keeping working on it. Um, I wanna throw open the questions from the chat and I've kind of been, looking at it looks like uh, we've had a, a lively back and forth in the chat with people answering each other's questions. I, I really appreciate that kind of crowdsourcing. Um, but Marion, do you want to pull out some questions for us? Um, I'm just going to start at the beginning because there may be other people not monitoring the chat that might have the same questions. So um, this was very early on. What was the percentage of Tennesseans that are in 10 care? Uh, Catherine, I think that's yeah. for you. Yeah, so it's approximately 21% of Tennesseans and it's 50% of Tennessee children. Okay, and the <clears throat> next one, sorry. The next question is 10 billion a year or 10 billion total since the passage of the ACA? Uh, it's total. Okay. Uh, what are the Tennessee legislature's reasons for rejecting the federal Medicaid money? What have they actually said? I can answer that one. Um, I, I did address that in my comments earlier, um, but I, I do need to add that many of them truly believe that it's an entitlement program. There is a stigma against people who are unemployed, um, who, who, are, who are sick, and it's viewed as um, they're just being lazy and they just don't want jobs. But it's interesting since the pandemic and you know, we've experienced so many job losses here in our state. Just yesterday, 10 Care gave its budget pres presentation to the governor, its budget proposal for next year. The number of people who have enrolled in 10 Care has increased by 200,000 people. So the roles are getting bigger. And those are just people who qualify. And there's even more now who um, just don't meet those income el eligibilities. So um, if we could um, somehow convince them that, you know, that stigma is not right, but overcoming stigma is tough. So um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and Margaret, you also had an example of, of that, of, um you know, a person who does not qualify, is not able to get insurance because of family circumstance. Yes. 
Um, I'm not sure which one now. Um, there were a couple of them that, because of family circumstances, couldn't get it. Um, when we were talking earlier, you were talking about a person who um, had been for many years a, a caretaker for a sick person. Okay, yes. Um, well, that would be Susan. And, and she um, is the person who, who did die. So, I, th I think that um, uh, Elisa was talking about the stigma, you know, why don't these people work? Why don't they have a job? And- um, Oh, okay. I'm thinking, this was a story I didn't read today, but it was, um, this was a person who was, was a professional and um, she left her, her position to become um, a full-time caregiver for a family member with dementia who um, it took a number of years that, you know, she was not working. And during that time period, she had no income. Um, she stayed in the person, the family member's home. And um, there, I'm not sure how much of this I want to, to share, but um, she, she um, ended up having a lot of dental work that she needed that couldn't um, be taken care of at the time. And later getting back into the workforce was difficult because she at that point had no teeth. Um, getting back to the question about what the state legislature, what they're saying, um, Alyssa had pointed out that um, I think you said this, that, that they didn't want to be in a position where they granted people a, a benefit and then had to take it back. And I, I have heard Randy McNally bring up that issue um, that he didn't want to be responsible for giving people a benefit that, that would then have to be taken back. And you know, when the Affordable Care Act first passed, uh, there was a lot of feeling that it wasn't going to last. Um, and there were a lot of attempts to repeal it and none of that. And, and I don't know, three support Supreme Court cases. So, um, you know, there, there was some feeling that it, it wasn't permanent, but here we are nine years later and um, none of those attempts have gotten anywhere. So I, I think, again, the equation maybe has changed on that. It now has. I and, oh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. No, I, and I, I was just gonna add that, um, Let's just say in a worst case scenario that happens. Well, guess what's happened over the past nine years? People have gotten healthier. In the states where expansion has taken place, chronic conditions might have been um, mitigated. So, but in the best case scenario, it continues. And right now this state has a lot of money. This state has an excess of money. So money should not be an excuse. <laughs> Here you go. Marion, have you got another question for us? Sure. Um, what's the name of the Vanderbilt Harvard study on the health effects of being covered by Medicaid, and where is it published? Yeah, it's a um, uh, it's in the journal Health Affairs, and the yeah. title of the article I can share it in the chat. Um, but the title of the article is "Medicaid Expansion Slowed Rates of Health Decline for Low Income Adults in Southern States," and I'll go ahead and share the link to the article. Okay. All right. Um, the next question is, does improved mental health coverage lower prison populations and those costs? Ah, that sounds like a question for me. <laughs> um, I wish I had some figures in front of me, um, top, you know, top of mind, but I don't. But um, yes, what tends to happen in jails is inmates are not getting their medications. They're not getting mental health treatment because there's not enough money for, for it. There's this disconnect between the Medicaid program. The Medicaid program stops funding once you go to jail. And you know, we would like to see that continue, Medicaid coverage continue during incarceration. Um, it, it, as far as the, the reduction in, in criminal justice, I mean, we would like to see people get help 
rather than handcuffs. And I think that getting people into proper care and in treatment would um, would definitely, in, in, in many ways, lower the cost, but a lot of it also, it's more complicated because law enforcement officers need to be educated on the difference between a mental health crisis and just illegal, unlawful, bad behavior. So there's a, a component to that too. But there has to be places to go to take these people, walk-in centers, treatment centers, and then who's going to pay for that service? So. Got another question for us, Marian? Um, yeah. About three years ago, Randy McNally acknowledged to me and my husband that the majority of Tennesseans, including Republicans, want the state to expand Medicaid. Okay, I'm sorry, that's just a comment. <laughs> um, here's another one. As far as the possible excuse from legislators that TenCare is an entitlement program, I think it's important to point out that virtually all health care is subsidized. Group tax exemptions, Medicare A and B are essentially subsidized to the tune of 75%. Individual policies are subsidized via healthcare.gov. The VA is obviously federally subsidized, so it's not just TenCare that had federal subsidy support. Can I, can I respond to that? Because Andrew, you bring up a really great point. The reason why Medicare um, isn't cut more um, is because the individuals who are eligible for Medicare are a very powerful voting block and they raise cane when Congress tries to mess with their coverage. The 10 care population doesn't have a voice. Some of them don't even have internet access to write their legislators an email. And that's where we come in and why it's so important to, to step in and be their voice. <clears throat> So here's uh, one more question. Does proper mental health care reduce the occurrence of arrests for mental health problems? So that is a question that does not have a simple answer because the question assumes that people with mental illness commit crimes and that's not accurate. Um, certainly people who get proper mental health treatment um, can go on to live healthy, productive lives. So it's really hard to make that connection that people with mental illness um, commit crimes and if they get the treatment, then there'll be no crimes. So actually people who have mental illness are more likely to be a victim of a crime. So we just don't have any clear cut answers for that one, sorry. Catherine, do you want to weigh in on these issues about um, mental health care and, and tank care as well? Uh, sure. So, I mean, as, you know, Alyssa has, um, you know, discussed, I mean, um, Medicaid has some special protections in there for folks that other um, health care options may not have. Um, so it's very vital to the health of Tennesseans, um, many of which are um, underserved and desperately need these services. Um, we absolutely need to expand um, this coverage. Marion, do you have other questions for us? Um, yes. Um, what is the status of Governor Lee's efforts to turn Medicaid into block grants? Uh, Neil, you want to give that one a try? You know, I, I'm just not uh, um, current with, with, with how that stands. Uh, Catherine, do, do you want to talk about Ten care three. Uh, you know, I uh, there's quite a bit of controversy surrounding that, um, and um, you know, the validity of that option. Um, 
I guess I'm really not prepared to speak on that right now. I, I can answer that if, if you'd like. Sure. Um, so uh, the question is the status of Governor's Lee, Lee's, Governor Lee's efforts on the block grant. Um, the block grant has been approved. It's by the Trump administration. It's still in effect. It is what TenCare is operating under right now. And there has been a federal comment period, multiple federal comment periods, um, just recently as in September, and um, hundreds of organizations and individuals wrote the federal government in opposition about the block grant. And right now we're waiting to see what the Biden administration is gonna do. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we've got a series of questions here. Um, do the poor have higher mental health needs, perhaps due to stress? Perhaps the stress makes their employment difficult to maintain? Um, okay, so I'll uh, address the employment issue. Did you all know that um, the highest, Worker disability is mostly caused by anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression are the leading causes of worker disability. So what happens if an individual has anxiety or depression in the workplace? They often can't work. They um, have to quit their jobs and then they become low income and then they have to try to apply for Medicaid or TenCare. So in Tennessee, they probably can't get it. <laughs> um, it's just this cycle. So definitely being low income is a risk factor for mental illness. Some other risk factors are um, a history of drug and alcohol abuse, um, living alone, and um, being elderly. So yes, it is definitely a risk factor. Okay, uh, next question is, what new strategies do the Tennessee healthcare does the Tennessee healthcare campaign plan to use in 2022 to convince the legislature? Okay, I think maybe that's a question for me. Um, I dropped in the chat our latest action alert. Um, we are pushing each legislator on this issue. Um, we're in a position where, um, you know, there's a super majority of Republicans, so we need a Republican solution that's going to pass. And uh, we're encouraging those moderate Republican lawmakers um, to, to help us do that. Um, if you want to join us at the next part of this forum, which will be on November 16th. Senator Richard Briggs is gonna be speaking there. He's a Republican from um, Knoxville and he's been the, the Senate sponsor of Medicaid expansion. Um, and we're hoping we'll be again in the next legislative session. So, um, you know, we have been working on this for a while, but some of the players have changed there's different people in the legislature than were there when Governor Haslam tried to have this voted on. And um, as I said, the incentives have changed from the federal government. Um, so, uh, and COVID has happened. So I, I think maybe people are more open to a conversation about um, how to move this forward in, in Tennessee than maybe they were years ago. So um, the next thing in the, there's someone has posted in the chat box, a website where you can read about the block grants in Tennessee. And Elisa, Lapolt is is volunteering to um, do presentations about the mental health in Tennessee. Her her contact information is in the chat box. Awesome! Really appreciate your expertise on this issue, Elisa. 
Happy to be here. And I think that's all that's in the chat box right now. Okay, uh, for the audience, last chance to type something in. Um, if not, I, I really wanna thank our panelists. This has been a really interesting and far ranging conversation. And um, I think we, we've all come away with stuff um, uh, of interest. I want to thank the audience for joining us and a huge thank you to all the work that went on behind the scenes with the League of Women Voters of Oak Ridge. Um, a shout out to Carolyn Dubois, Abby Moore and Marion Varner. Thank you so much for um, helping make this, this event come across. As I said, this panel is the first of a two part series on Medicaid expansion. And our next lunch panel will take place on Tuesday, November 16th with State Senator Richard Briggs and State Representative Gloria Johnson as the panelists. And um, in the meantime, uh, as Margaret said, you can call your legislator, you can jump in on our action alert. Uh, you can also send a message to the federal, to the Congress to um, encourage them to pass the Build Back Better provisions that would uh, expand access to the Affordable Care Act for people in the gap right now. So um, thank you all for joining us and, and let's keep pushing this issue forward. <laughs>